Good, mo good morning, everyone. Um, I would like to, I I'd like you to forgive me for walking up and down and up and down and up and down and up and down. And you're going to see me running a lot today, so I apologize in advance. Um, I'm here today to invite our next plenary speaker of the day. Um, I, I was supposed to read something that Bruno wrote, but Bruno, I'm sorry, where's Bruno? I, I, I'm going to, just, you know, yeah, just yeah, improvise. Um, this person is very important for us uh, as a community because she was the one who brought the idea of leaving the virtual space and coming to you know, face-to-face -face event, and she, she highlighted the importance of bringing Brout to a more real environment, if you know what I mean. And, um, okay, okay, this always happens with me, only with me. And people talking, you can hear, right? So, um, and personally, she's a great friend of mine. We spent a great time, we spent great times together, and, I would like here to publicly thank her for pushing me forward and uh, kind of not not only pushing but kicking me out of my comfort zone, really. So um, I would, I had, now I have to read her bio because she's so amazing. I really can't, you know, that I couldn't memorize. Claire Venables spent a decade teaching in Europe, where she obtained her Trinity Dipti Soul and Oxford TEFL. She, was, uh, she has a wide range of experience as a teacher and teacher trainer, director of studies and materials writer. However, her passion is teaching English to primary and pre-primary learners. Since moving to Brazil in 2011, she has been involved in the creation of implementation of language programs in school, teaching training courses, and course book writing for Macmillan. She is an active member of the board, uh, she is an active member of the National English Teachers Association, Brass Cecil, and a board member uh, of two special, interest, uh, two special interest groups, Voices for Women and Young Learners and Teens, and the director of Active English. So without further ado, I'll give you Claire Venables. Thank you very much, Eduardo, um, and welcome. It is so relieving to see so many familiar faces here in the audience. <laughs> it really is. I feel like I know so many of you already, and you might feel the same about me. But I wanted to start with a little story that not many people know about me. I did arrive here in Brazil in 2011. It might seem that I've just appeared on the scene, but I have been dedicated to ELT for a very long time. And I gave up uh, a life and a career that I loved in Barcelona. And I moved to Espiritu Santo where I felt really lonely for the first four years. And it was the Borel community that really helped me reconnect. And I am forever grateful to all of you for being here today to listen to me speak about a topic that I'm so passionate about. <laughs> so this was, this was kind of a Eduardo's fault for getting me feeling really emotional about this, this journey that I've been on, um, to be up on this stage today and talking to you. And I'd like to say how grateful I am to the Brelt moderating team for this invitation to be here to talk to you today. And I'm very grateful to all of you for being here to listen. Because my talk, like I said, is something that I, I really, really have been going on about to anyone who'll listen for a long time. And now I have a captive audience of almost 400 people to talk to about it. So I'm really pleased. The title of this talk is It All Starts Here. And I'd like to tell you that I am um, on a mission. I'm on a mission to transform the way we teach English to children in Brazil. But I'm not so uh, presumptuous to assume that I can do this on my own. I'm all about connecting with other like-minded and passionate teachers to help me get there. And that's what today's talk is about. My talk today is more of a call to action than anything else. And I want to see who I have here in the audience today. Can I just see how many young learner teachers you have here, primary, 
are your students primary learners? Look how many of us we are. Keep your hand up so I can really see you. Now, if you teach children who are of secondary age, can you put your hand up as well? Keep your hands up. I need to see all of the hands up to see if there's anyone who this talk is not for. So if you teach secondary students, okay. If you are the director of studies, keep your hands up, please. Join them with your hand up. If you teach, if you are a, a director of studies of a school who has children in it. Can you, I, I can't see my young learner teachers anymore. Can you put your hands up here? Okay. So we've got young learner teachers, secondary, people who are, quarter, okay. Do you write materials for young learners? Okay. Do you teach adults who were at one stage children? <laughs> Great. That's fantastic. That means this talk, this talk is for everyone. This talk, I hope my message today will reach everyone because we are going to be discussing or I will be highlighting the role of the young learner teacher in our industry, the importance of that role. But it's also about recognising that, guys, we're all connected. I'd like to examine the immediate challenges that the young learner teacher is facing today, but also make some predictions about how young learner teaching will impact everyone. We have got a new generation of learners coming and if and this is a big if, if we get this right, this will have changes for everyone in our industry. Now, as we're well aware, foreign language learning, oh, this is what we're talking about. As you're well aware, foreign language learning is becoming more and more present in preschool and primary classrooms all over the country and throughout the world. In fact, in Europe, it has been steadily finding its way into compulsory education since the, the late 90s. And for the last decade, it's been part of the compulsory school curriculum in just about every EU country and others around the world. Now, Brazil is no exception. There is an increasing number of schools and preschools offering English at an earlier age. And while I don't have reliable numbers to back me up on this, I'm sure you've all seen it, right? Seven years ago when I arrived in Brazil, I have a, a son. He was about one and a half when we arrived. And I went looking for options for him for preschool. And I wanted somewhere where he would have English. And this is in the Espiritu Santo. And I couldn't find anywhere. Literally, there was nowhere that offered English for any age younger than five. And the places that I saw, uh, the five-year-old, uh, classes for five-year-olds were once a week. I even had one coordinator question my decision to talk to my son in English at home, worried that I would somehow be confusing him. Fast forward seven years in that same state, it seems like every second school is wanting to slap the word bilingual on its door. Are you noticing the same thing as me? Yeah. So this is a huge industry and it's a booming industry, particularly here in Brazil. Um, some years ago, the IA TEFL Young Learner Teen SIG uh, got together with the British Council and they had a conference about young learner policy and the report from that conference is fascinating. Um, there were a range of different countries represented. It wasn't just Europe, it was from all over the world. And they identified two key beliefs underpinning the reason that there has been this push. They're my very young learners, by the way, in Espiritu Santo. And that's me and the kids. Um, so these were the two key beliefs underpinning this push for an earlier start in foreign language learning. Now, please do not take a photo of this slide and start sharing it and saying, Claire Venable says this is why we should start earlier. Let's go step by step. These were the beliefs that seemed to be justifying this push. First of all, this idea that younger children are better at learning languages or somehow find it easier. And the second idea was that a longer period of learning tends leads to higher proficiency by the end of schooling. Now, anyone who is even slightly up to date with the latest discussions going on about this topic will know that there is an ongoing debate about this concept of an optimal age for language learning. Some people say yes to a very early start, other people say nine or ten, there are people saying as late as uh, early teens is the optimal age. There's a lot of debate going on and right, but right or wrong, what I can tell you is this. Parents, schools, 
even learners themselves are convinced that there is somehow this advantage to starting earlier. Now, um, we don't know if it really there is earlier, if it's earlier the better, but what we do know are the downward pressures and upward pressures that are driving forward this, this push for an earlier start. Now, the downward pressures, as Gradol says, comes from governments who know that a pr English uh, 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 population which is proficient in English leads to better development from the workforce. And here in Latin America, there's wide recognition that English proficiency is a requirement for developing natural producti national productivity and integration into the global economy and overall international competitiveness. But there's also this upward pressure. And anyone who's worked uh, in coordination, or maybe even you're a parent yourself, you'll know that parents want their children to be proficient in English. There seems to be this perceived social or economic benefit in achieving that. And right or wrong, many are under the impression that the best chance of that happening is through an early start. Now, the European, uh, Commission, uh, the European Commission's Department for Education and Training now says the following. They say, and this is on their website, you can find this on their website, they say that early language learning can influence attitudes towards other languages and cultures and may result in faster learning, improved mother tongue skills and better performance in other areas. Now, this is something I can definitely jump on board with. When done right, foreign language learning in childhood can bring about a range of benefits. And I think this has been backed up with sufficient evidence um, to justify additional languages. Typically English as a compulsory part of primary and even pre-primary education. At any rate, regardless of if uh, there isn't a, a bilog biological advantage or not, our current situation is this. There are estimated to be upward of 500 million children in the early stages of compulsory schooling worldwide earning, learning English as an additional language. That is an incredible figure. Young learner teachers are in high demand and they're an essential part of any school wanting to offer English to young and very young learners. In Brazil especially, where this boom is more recent, it's actually kind of an exciting time to be a young learner teacher. There are so many opportunities out there for us. But while schools are racing to offer English to younger and younger learners, has anyone considered who is going to teach? Has anyone, going to be, has anyone considered how it's going to be taught? Is the market moving faster than we can responsibly deal with? So what does it take to be an effective young learner teacher? Who can we put in those classrooms? And this question was recently posted in our Facebook group. And the ensuing discussion led to me going on a bit of a rant. Has anyone seen that post where I, I rant? <laughs> yeah? By social media standards, it wasn't a treta. <laughs> it wasn't, it wasn't. But I'm sure I'm gonna learn a lot from Natalia's talk this afternoon on how I might have been able to communicate myself better. But it is an issue that I get passionate about. And I did go on a rant. And I, I, I wanna talk about this here. Um, did you wanna see the post? Yeah? Okay, here we go. So it was from Fernanda, and I asked permission to her to post this. She posed this really valid question. She was preparing a project and she said, um, she posted this to the group, as we do in Brelt, and she said, does anyone, oh, she said this, I, you can't read it there, so I'm going to read it out to you here. Dear fellow teachers, I really need your help for a project. I would really appreciate it if you'd leave a comment answering the following question. In your opinion, what are some essential skills a teacher should have to teach young learners? How would you answer that question? Pay careful attention to the wording. She says essential skills. Would anyone say patience? Yeah. Love, love of children, motivation, passion, energy, empathy. If you think these are good answers, you're not alone. These were the words that were repeated over and over again in the thread from young learner teachers. Now you're probably thinking, but Claire, what are you complaining about? These are all essential skills for the young learner teacher, right? I'm not saying that they're not essential. They are essential. 
What I'm saying is they're not skills. These are personal qualities. And let me tell you something else. All around the world, people with these qualities, particularly young women, are being thrown into the young learner classroom without training or support and six months later, what do you think has happened to their passion, love of children, motivation, energy? And <laughs> exactly. So that was basically what I ranted on about. I think, and I'm here to advocate um, for a change in the way we talk about young learner teachers and young learner teaching. And I feel that I am qualified to do that because I am a young learner teacher. I don't just talk the talk, I walk the walk. It's been 17 years that I've been developing my skills as a teacher. And I know, how do I get this to play? I don't know how to get this to play. Yes, there we go. And I know about the creative side of teaching and the passion and the love and the motivation. That's what's kept me going for the 17 years because the pay certainly hasn't. It's about testing Play-Doh recipes in your kitchen. Man, if I had a hiao for every toilet roll I've saved from the bin. The printing, the painting, the cutting, the songs, the games, the storytelling. That's what really I love about teaching kids. I do. Do the young learner teachers in the room know what I'm talking about here? I see a lot of nodding heads. That's the inspirational part. That's when we can get in touch with our creative side and our sense of fun or play. But it takes so much more to be a really effective young learner teacher. Much more than passion, motivation and a love of children. We need real skills. <laughs> Don't be confused by the Mary Poppins costume. There is an oversimplification of the way learning happens in the young learner classroom. And there is certainly an oversimplification of the way people see the job that we do as young learner teachers. Um, as, uh, as, young, as the author uh, Lynn Cameron puts it, a young learner teacher is required not only to have a knowledge of the language and of language teaching and learning, but in addition, all the skills of a good primary teacher in managing and keeping children on task. Um, Nowadays, beyond the role of teaching English, we have the additional responsibility of instilling positive attitudes towards the language and learning itself. We have critical thinking skills, life skills. We're told that we must prepare our students to become global citizens. We've got CLIL, PBL, effective learning, positive discipline, and the list goes on and on. Teaching children may be very different to teaching adults, but it is in no way a less complex or less challenging task. Now, unfortunately, as we've mentioned before, there's this persisting idea that children will just pick it up if exposed to it early enough. And I think that does more harm than good. It's not true. At least it's not true under any old circumstances. Um, we've got to stop oversimplifying the complexity of teaching foreign language to children. Teaching children is not merely an extension of mothering. And this misconception is possibly one of the reasons we get called sheer. Um, today I'm here to advocate, like I said, a shift in the way we describe the young learner teacher and let me tell you why. I think Chia describes beautifully the loving, affectionate, um, kind, patient relationship that we have with our students, but it fails to recognise the wide range of knowledge and skills that we need to be effective teachers. Whew, rant over. <laughs> um, it feels very therapeutic to be able to say that to a stage, uh, up here on a stage. Um, this misconception, it is a serious issue, this misconception along with this continued belief that children are biologically better language learners has led young learner, young learner professionals as being seen as little more than glorified babysitters in a lot of cases. And this may account for the fact that the ma vast majority of us, and I've spoken to so many teachers about this, the vast majority of us are thrown into the young learner classroom with, for the first time with less training, status, pay and even language proficiency in comparison to teachers of older learners. It seems absurd to me because a well-trained teacher is an incredibly important factor in the effectiveness of a language course. In fact, Brumford goes on to say that there's little justification for exposing learners to teachers who themselves lack confidence in their ability to teach and use the target language. But this is what we're doing. And at this point, I want to sort of uh, give a shout out to Igor, Ka Igor Kavokanchi, who's been traveling around the, 
the country with the very hard task of telling teachers that we do need to improve our language proficiency. So hats off to Igor for that tough job because it's not easy to say that. But it's true. Now, if we're going to be talking about quality in long-term projects, if we're going to be talking about real educational change, we can look to the experiences in other, con uh, uh, other countries to, to get some ideas on how we might do this. Now, it's going to take the whole community to get behind this. It's not just about what I'm doing in my classroom that's going to bring about change. It's not just about me on my little mission. Um, a failure to provide quality at the very early language, early stages of language learning can have negative repercussions for the teacher, the school, and most importantly, for the learners themselves. And yet, we don't see any training for this specialised area in Letras or CELTA. And how many of you can honestly say that you were given enough su sufficient in-service or pre-service training? How many of you received regular support and incentives to continue developing? When we think about quality, we really can learn from other experiences and translate these to our own context. And here's a little summary um, of some of these, these recommendations. To get quality in teaching English to young learner programs, we need both top-down and bottom-up procedures. That means we need collaborations between governments and practitioners. We need flagship programs and we need to get the involvement of teachers and head teachers if we're going to see large-scale educational change. We also need adequate pre-service and continuing training to prepare professionals for the challenges and the specific needs of children at their different developmental stages. We need to ensure continuity. I can't stress how important this is. As children transfer from one grade to another, from primary to secondary, there needs to be continuity. There's no point seeing the verb to be and the book is on the table every year. We need more local and international co uh, collaborations and research. And we're not, they're not just talking about research in universities. They're talking about small-scale research from teachers like you. Teachers need to start getting theory into their classroom to, to, to justify what it is that they're doing. And then they need to go back and inform uh, the academics about what's going on in those classrooms. We need to be working together for this. We also need policy recommendations with guidelines on how those policies might be implemented. But what if we get it right? What if we do? It may seem like an incredibly difficult task that we're we're up against, but what if we get it right? What's going to happen? So far in this really quick summary, we've looked at the increase in the number of children learning English as a foreign language across the world and the possible factors which are driving a push for an earlier start. We've looked at the urgent need for governments and schools to prepare and support teachers who are working with young learners due to the complex range of skills and knowledge required. And it's clear to me that an earlier start has and will continue to impact the publishing industry, particularly as we continue to develop theoretical perspectives concerning child development and learning and how they differ, differ from adult learning and how this translates into materials. And also as educational objectives and approaches outside of ELT change, so too will the demands and expectations of our learners. So as Vinicius Norbert has told us, in fact, he's got a wonderful talk on this, we too must evolve as teachers if we are to remain relevant. So how does this evolve, involve you? You sitting there in the audience thinking, Claire, I never have and I never will teach kids. Well, surely you must see where I'm going with this. First of all, you better hope that we young learner teachers get it right. At the very least that we stop traumatising our students in primary and high school. Because those adult learners are the worst, aren't they? How many of you have learners who you think maybe need a little bit of therapy to overcome those early experiences? <laughs> okay, so that's one thing. But if we do get it right, you also need to prepare yourselves for this new generation of learners. The European Union is now saying that they want uh, young learners to leave secondary school with a B2 level of English. 
And uh, Louise Bartles has posed this question, why isn't anyone talking about the A1 learner anymore? Well, Louise, it might be because the A1 learner is slowly disappearing. Anecdotal evidence that has reached me from Barcelona, this is purely anecdotal as well, but uh, recently, earlier this year, Anna Stubbs, the course director from the CELTA at Oxford TEFL, um, gave a talk with numbers, actually, about this topic. Uh, and she said that it's become increasingly difficult to find A1 learners in Spain these days. So this is something that we need to keep our mind on and our eye on. Um, as well, with all of these amazing things that us young learner teachers are doing in the classroom with our critical thinking and our 21st century skills and our CLIL and our PBL, young learners are going to be arriving in your classroom with much higher expectations about what a language lesson looks like. So you need to evolve your teaching practice as well. Because your PPP and your traditional lesson and your dusty old copy of New English File is just not going to cut it anymore. <laughs> I wanted to give this talk today because this is a conversation that I think is long overdue. If we want English, the level of proficiency of English in this country to improve, we really need to start talking about the young learner teacher. We really need to ensure that quality is present right from the initial stages of the learning journey. And nowadays, that all starts in the young learner classroom. When it comes to an early start, though, it's only an optimal age when there are optimal conditions. I've forgotten all about my slides. I'm so sorry, I forgot about my slides. It's only an optimal age when uh, there are optimal conditions. So we need to redefine the way young learners are taught and the way we see young learner teachers. We need to start giving them the recognition and the support that they need to succeed. And we also need to remind ourselves that despite some of the uh, misconceptions there are around and some of the messages that we're told, language learning doesn't happen in six months. It doesn't happen in a year. Continuity between the different ages is essential. My young learners will become teenagers and adults in someone else's classroom, possibly your classroom. So while it all may start in the young learner classroom, it continues far beyond that and it involves us all. We need collaboration between educators, materials writers, policy writers, policy makers and schools if we're going to make this work. My mission is to transform the way English is taught to children in Brazil. And I can't do it alone. And that mission starts here in this room with this community, Brelt. I hope this session has inspired you all to join me. Thank you very much for listening. Let's connect. You can contact me on uh, any of these. And this here is a uh, link to a WhatsApp group called It All Starts Here. This is just for Brelt, the Brelt community. And in this group, I'll be sharing my slides, my references, lots of amazing articles for anyone who wants to continue reading about this topic and who's interested in it. I'm also going to be giving away free places for Brelters. I've got lots of, I've got a whole series of new short courses coming up, being launched in 2019 in January, and I want to offer free places for my Brelt community. I'm also going to be for materials writers in the org, in the audience, I'm collaborating with Sue Kay and um, Karen Spillen from uh, Teacher to Materials Writer and we're going to be with Lucy Crichton in Florianopolis for a writer's retreat. If you'd like information about that, also please feel free to join my group. I'm serious about this, guys, and I'm serious about teaming up with you. Thank you again. <laughs>